this is maybe shocking for people who know me as a supreme culture warrior, there may be a glimmer of hope in resolving the culture wars if we can also, if we can attend to our political economy. It doesn't mean all of these questions will go away, but they can lower the temperature a little bit. The death of God is about the drying up of a horizon of meaning and of a whole form of human life. Where do we stand in the illusion it makes? What kind of space are we invited into? The material relations between people become social relations between things. When we look at toasters, corn, and TVs, we don't see... We still, to a large extent, live in the interregnum between between worlds, if you will, or between paradigms. Not many people in the history of the world have faced that. Diet Soap is a Sublation Media podcast. Uh, today I'm talking to Sorab Amari. Uh, he is a founding editor of the online magazine Compact. He is a contributing editor of the Catholic Herald and a columnist for First Things. Previously, he served as the op-ed editor at the New York Post. Uh, he was a columnist and editor with the Wall Street Journal, and he worked uh, for a commentary as a senior writer. Uh, so I'm welcome to the Diet Soap podcast. Thanks for having me, Doug. Yeah, so I, I'm glad to get the, a chance to talk to you about your book, uh, Tyranny Incorporated, How Private Power Crushed American Liberty and What to Do About It. Um, my audience who knows about you might think of you uh, primarily as a conservative mm-hmm. and might be surprised to find out that your book is, you know, begins – with a, a description of the rights of labor and that you are very, con- you know, interested and concerned about the uh, plight of working class people in America. Um, so I, I'm wanting to start by asking you a simple question. What are the rights of labor and how are those rights undermined today? And to put it a little bit differently, how do you and then how did Abraham Lincoln conceive of the rights of labor? Yeah, so um, for me, it's an ineluctable fact that the modern economy uh, largely separates people into two classes. We call them the asset owners and uh, those who are assetless, um, uh, the proletariat and capitalists, what have you. But it's it's a it's a fact. It's a um, an inevitable outcome, especially becomes entrenched after the industrial revolution. And so um, that creates conditions in which the asset less many uh, live at the mercy of the asset less few. This was something that, of course, uh, you know, Marx put his finger on most acutely in the 19th century. Um, But it was a concern for not just Marx, for many people in the 19th century and leading up to um, the the calamities of the world war, uh, of the world wars and the depression. And in response to that, uh, at least uh, in the in the West, in Western Europe, and to a lesser extent in the United States, there developed a series of responses to try to um, ameliorate the inequalities in power uh, that are generated by uh, by by the market, and uh, those inequalities in power. And I'll get to your question about whether where the rights right, the rights of labor is to to live basically. Um, decent lives of dignity and stability, which is you know, to be able to flourish um, in family and community, all of that is undermined uh, uh, by the inequalities that are inherent to to the market society. Um, and so I, I begin by by mentioning Abraham Lincoln because Abraham Lincoln, as, as great as he was, had this great um, shortcoming, which was that Um, His ideals about political economy, which are probably most crisply articulated in his speech, the Wisconsin Agricultural Society um, in 1859, just before he became president, um, are ideas that are rooted in a world of yeoman farmers. It's a um, they're they're, he's he's looking back to this sort of cheery Arcadia of uh, what were called masterless men. So yeoman farmers. They were called mechanics, et cetera, 
before the rise of, of the Industrial Revolution. And so they could always transact at an arm's length. Uh, you know, I bring you my surplus and I trade with you. We truck and barter and then we walk away. It's obviously not what modern industrial relations played out like. And even in Lincoln's own time, this uh, separation of the classes and proletarianization on a mass scale was already unfolding. The pro- So therefore, he had this idea that um, that no one is ever a worker forever. You know, he says the penniless beginner beginner in the world starts out uh, that way and then he, he labors and comes to be able to own his own tools and then he can hire other people and those penniless beginners in turn eventually become entrepreneurs and so on. Mm-hmm. Um, that's just not how the economy was even working in the mid 19th century, frankly. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's a romantic vision. And, um, but that's kind of really baked into the American idea of um, what the, what the economy is like. And it's still that romance still shapes, um, shapes us ideologically and it has legal ramifications, right? So, because if the condition of labor is not, a permanent thing. It's not something that, you know, vast majorities of people will always be wage earners for most of their lives, uh, but rather a transitory thing, a step on the way to becoming entre- entre- an entrepreneur, then you can tolerate a, ro- a lot in, 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 the, uh, in terms of mm-hmm. inequality and so forth, because eventually, uh, you know, the, the penniless beginner will become his own master and will in turn hire other people. Um, so that's why I begin with that um, kind of the, it's a Lincolnian tragedy because in so many other ways, obviously he was an incredible statesman, but on the on issues of political economy, um, he, he could not let go of the pre-industrial world. Right. <clears throat> Reading his comments in your book, I was um, reminded of a quote from Margaret Thatcher, a quote from Thatcher that I first heard from uh, the comedian Stuart Lee. Uh, mm-hmm. as he was doing a comedy routine about Thatcherism and Scooby-Doo, but I won't burden you with an explanation of that. But the quote from Thatcher is, if a man finds himself a passenger on a bus having attained the age of 26, he can count himself a failure in life. So uh, Lincoln said, if one remains a wage worker for the duration of his life, it is not the fault of the system, but because of either a dependent nature which prefers it or improvidence, folly, or singular misfortune. Mm -hmm. So the vision was that everyone would be a capitalist eventually or have assets and and produce commodities that they could exchange. But you point out that history falsified this. I mean, Lincoln was clinging to this pre-industrial past. What I wonder is, what was it, do you think, that made the proletarian class permanent, a permanent feature in our political economy? Um, What is the ultimate culprit behind the undoing of those rights of labor, which were the rights to produce for themselves and and exchange, to be property owners in a sense. Yeah, I mean, I think it's just a a product of of the industrial economy as such. Uh, When you you have a pre-industrial economy, the barriers to entry are very few. And sure, you know, you can have mechanics who each own their own tools, and then through guild structures, they protect their wages, but also pass on the craft generation to generation and so forth. But when you have uh, uh, economies of scale, when you have, um, in fact, simplification of labor in many ways, that you know, that kind of mastery um, goes away and people are just doing um, you know, much, much narrower things when they're on the, on the factory floor. Um, all of that makes it so that unless you can begin with uh, you know, of course, and the typical apologist for free market fundamentalism will always point to exceptional cases where that's not the case. But it's the inexorable tendency that when you have economies of scale, when you have, especially in the modern world, um, uh, uh, you know, network effects, etc., it's not so easy for um, the ordinary person. The, the, it's not impossible. But the inexorable tendency is that they can't uh, uh, become capitalists. Um, and then you have, you know, since since then, since the mid 19th century or so, whenever you want to uh, put the inception date, um, you actually have a great deal of uh, of solidification of the class structure, contrary to what people think about um 
mobility for social mobility in the Anglo-American world. Again, mobility being the thing that supposedly justifies the system. It justified the system for for Lincoln, clearly, the idea of equality of, of opportunity creating mobility. It, it, from that quote, it's certainly true that Thatcher and Reagan, many others, Paul Ryan, um, plenty of neoliberals think that um, what justifies the state of affairs is mobility. But the fact is that, um, you know, studies show that in order for the effects of, of, of paternal wealth, of generational paternal wealth to, um, to go away as a social factor, roughly speaking, it takes, you know, five to seven generations in the Anglo-American world. It takes a little bit less in the in continental Europe because to some extent, I suppose, social democracy is a stronger tradition there. But um, so we could just... It, 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 it's very obvious that that people aren't circulating through the classes the way that, uh, um, you know, liberals bro broadly understood always have hoped they would. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, it, it's a, just a fact of industrial production that there will be a working class and uh, and w whether or not individuals can rise up uh, above it, someone will then fall you know mm -hmm. into it uh, mm -hmm. basically and it has to be of a certain size um but the i guess as a marxist my question is you know can we conceive of an industrial society that wouldn't require uh a, a, a proletariat that wouldn't require mm -hmm. the working class but it's not a, that's not a question i'm gonna force you to try to answer that's that's mm -hmm. for me uh, um but uh you write about alicia fleming uh, and why did you decide to tell her story? Yeah, sure. So to step back a bit, um, the the book is an attack on the idea that free market societies are largely bereft of coercion. That is, um, a lot of people in the Anglo-American world think of coercion as something that happens in foreign dictatorships, as you know what happens in you know, China, Russia, or Iran, where I come from. And it's, it's certainly true that, you know, on the political plane, there is a kind of brute coercion um, that you see in those, in, under those uh, sorts of political orders that you don't in, in the democratic West. So mm -hmm. to, to be clear, nevertheless, um, I argue, and I think plenty in the Marxist tradition, but also plenty in the social democratic tradition have taken note of the fact that in fact, supposedly non-coercive uh, societies like ours are suffused with coercion. That in fact, maybe coercion is inevitable in human affairs, but uh, in uh, free market societies and capitalist societies, um, it's difficult to even conceive of the coercion that we're subjected to that envelops us in the course of our economic lives because we're told that that's private. That is the private economy, and therefore, um, everyone is free to find the best deal they can. You can always walk away from a deal. Of course, we know that that's not true, again, because of the inequalities in power, bargaining power, et cetera, that are just inherent to the class structure and the market economy. Mm -hmm. uh, nevertheless, it's a, it's a prevailing myth that, um, you know, coercion that's not that we don't do that here, you know, except to people who, you know, double park their cars or you know, if you if you don't pay your taxes, so on and so forth. But otherwise, in the market economy, you're free from coercion. And so I tell the story of Alicia Fleming as an as an illustrative story because she was a, a waitress in Massachusetts um, who was actually making a decent life. You know, uh, as a waitress, she was uh, you know worked her way up from fast food to luxury restaurants. Um, and paid the bills until she had her uh, first child. And then suddenly, uh, you know, it all became much more difficult because this was happening at a time when in the service industry, uh, which uh, in which 25 million Americans uh, labor, uh, mm -hmm. is increasingly turning to what's called just-in-time scheduling. That is... Um, and often an algorithmically dri driven system for scheduling labor that minimizes labor costs. The idea is that um, all the costs that are associated with periods of low demand are shifted onto workers. Um, typically, if you have 
you know, a shift that runs from, I don't know, nine to five or five to midnight or what have you, there will be periods of low demand. And if it's a predictable schedule, both the employer and the employee, you know, both take a hit from periods of low demand. Uh, the employer pays wages, uh, the employee doesn't get tips or what have you. But if you do this kind of scheduling, where it's, for example, they call them clopening shifts, where workers are only scheduled for like an hour or two at the opening when there's expected to be high demand, and then at the closing sec- last two hours of the shift, because that's when you need to clean up and so forth. And in between, you know, you're basically you're not working. Um, or you schedule workers at the very last minute so that, for example, a third of those 25 million Americans I spoke about, um, studies show, don't have a sense of what their upcoming schedule is going to be like until a week beforehand if they, and, and, or less than a week beforehand. Mm-hmm. Um, so obviously that's good for, the, for, for employers, right? Because uh, it just means that they don't pay wages precisely when they don't need to, and they do at the minimum where they, it's, there's actually sort of a, a need to pay wages. But it's it makes a chaos of the lives of ordinary people because, you know, in the case of Alicia Flem- Fleming, she has a child, she wants to pick up the hours, but any given moment when she's given notice of when she had to come to work, uh, you know, she d- doesn't have the capacity to just miracle childcare or what have you. So that irregularity in her schedule creates both financial precarity because, there's never any sort of certainty about whether or not you're able to pick up enough hours, but also this other phenomenon of scheduling precarity, mm-hmm. which again, I sound, I'm like studies show, but studies do show that, um, you know, workers who are subjected to this hate the wage precarity less than they do the scheduling precarity because it causes them bad sleep, uh, depression, anxiety, and the children of workers who are treated this way, um, are more likely to show symptoms of anxiety, to be angry, to misbehave at school, and so on and so forth. So mm-hmm. what do you call that, um, right, when you're in a situation when your schedule is so at the mercy of, of your employers? I argue that's coercion. And, it, and I, there are much more brutal cases of coercion in the American labor market, you know, workers who are forced to uh, relieve themselves in bottles, or who are who work alongside, you know, autonomous colleagues, aka robots, who then sometimes malfunction and hurt you. You mm-hmm. know, uh, but I picked this one because it's so ordinary. There's nothing illegal, you know, under current labor law about scheduling your, you know, work, workers' time that way. Um, there's no vicious, you know, harassing boss there. It's just it's just scheduling, right? It seems so ordinary, mm-hmm. and yet. It, showcases the degree to which, you know, the, again, the assetless few can uh, coerce the assetless many and just sort of make a wreck of their lives. Sublation Media is coming to New York City. On August 18th and 19th, we'll be hosting events at Columbia University in room 517 in Hamilton Hall. On August 18th, Sorab Amari from Compact Magazine and our own Chris Catrone will be discussing their books, The Death of the Millennial Left and Tyranny Incorporated, from 5 to 7 p.m. Other panelists will include myself as a moderator, Ashley Frawley, and Jacob Siegel, the author of the essay, A Guide to Understanding the Hoax of the Century. On the 19th, Chris Catrone will discuss his book, The Death of the Millennial Left, and room 517 from 3 to 5 p.m., taking questions from the audience. See Sublation Media sublate the current moment in New York City. We can sublate it there. We can sublate it anywhere. Yeah, I mean, you avoid a lot of expenses as a business owner if you only have part-time workers. Sure, and if yeah. you And if you don't have to pay for wages when there is a lull, when they're not necessary then obviously you're saving there. Um, and uh, yeah, there, I guess there's no, uh, with, with unorganized labor, there's no way to demand that if you work for a company, you, you get a certain number of hours and you get a certain kind of, you know, wages and benefits and things like that. So yeah, it's very precarious. Um, and this didn't used to be the case in the uh, restaurant business because they had set hours. So they would bring waiters in, you know, to fill the whole shift. And now they don't have to because of computer technology. Um, so, and, and what that shows, I guess, is that the market and innovation doesn't necessarily lead to good outcomes 
for most people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so there are lots of other examples in your book of the coercion that is kind of built into the market. I mean, all of it hinges on the class character of the, mm -hmm. of the free market. Mm -hmm. Um, but another one is, um, corporate bankruptcies, uh, uh the way that they're de deployed and how the courts, um, are, are slanted for the boss mm -hmm. when it comes to these kinds of laws. Do you want to describe? Sure. That? So uh, people think of bankruptcy, especially Chapter 11 reorganization, as one of the least coercive aspects of our otherwise kind of pugilistic, rough and tumble legal system. Um, mm -hmm. The reason is that the goal of, of the bankruptcy code, um, which is a federal um, federal regime, is to stabilize businesses and try to retain value that would otherwise be lost um, it, when if the business has run into a patch of trouble and all the business's uh, creditors, whether that's employees, uh, lenders, pensions, uh, you know, people who have um, lawsuits against the business, they'll all run rush to the courthouse um, and they'll try to claw each other's eyes out. Um, in a, in a rush to the courthouse um, to get the, as much they can of their recover as much as they can of what they're owed from the business struggling businesses assets. So there's like um, a sort of rationality to the bankruptcy code, which uh, you can appreciate that instead of having them do that, the court puts a stay on all collections and claims of that kind and um, forces the creditors to, um, come to terms and sort of they, they all have to agree to take some amount of a haircut as it's called mm -hmm. um and so you don't and nobody gets what they really ultimately are fully owed but what that allows the business to do is to continue to operate um it can uh continue to even seek fresh financing to continue to um preserve jobs to preserve consumer value that would be otherwise lost under the kind of hammer blow of the auctioneers um liquidating assets, so on and so forth. So, but what's what's often lost is that that process, the idea of um, the court uh, telling creditors to stay put for a while is in fact very coercive. It's telling people, you know, you can't recover, you can't, otherwise rights that you have on paper will have to be sort of put on hold for the good of the whole. And, and um, again, in theory, it's very rational. In theory, there's something worthwhile about that. In practice, though, um, oh, as this Chapter 11 bankruptcy process has unfolded in the American court system, it's become a game for wealthy debtors to try to avoid liabilities they otherwise have. So um, the, I cite the case, for example, of Johnson & Johnson, which has been involved in um, litigation over talc powder, which a lot of millions of people claim has caused them, uh, caused cancer. And um, Johnson & Johnson is worth, you know, last I checked, like half a trillion dollars. It's one of the world's wealthiest corporations. Um, and yet what Johnson & Johnson did was it separated itself into two parts. It created this separate entity called LTL because it was facing these lawsuits. And it offloaded all of it, all of its lawsuits, all of its liabilities onto LTL, and then LTL declared bankruptcy. And so that you know, had that been allowed to go forward, Johnson and Johnson would be able to um, pay pennies on the dollar through the bankruptcy process, where otherwise it would have had to face courtroom justice with all that that entails. You know, uh, it's a very kind of sinister and obvious case of of that. Another one. Um, is what the Sacklers got away with. Um, the Sacklers, as a family, are still billionaires. People don't know this. That's the family behind Oxycontin, this very destructive opioid mm -hmm. which was unethically uh, uh, marketed and pushed. Um, and we still live with the opioid scourge. Uh, hundreds of thousands of Americans have lost their lives to it. Um, the Sacklers are still billionaires. People don't, many people don't know this. And the way that, that they did that is, is by gaming the Chapter 11 bankruptcy process in, in a complex way that I tell the story in the chapter. It's very hard to summarize mm. uh, in, you know, in a brief time. But the bottom line is that um, 
they used a process called a third party release, which is that um, even though you yourself are not the debtor, right? The debtor in this case was their company, Purdue Pharma. They nevertheless got what's a third party release so that they also got the benefits of the bankruptcy process to shield their assets in exchange for making a contribution to a sort of rest, a fund uh, intended for opioid victims and others who've been harmed by, by Oxycontin. But, um, you know, they had to pay up. Apparently, they're going to pay up like six billion dollars, which to you and I, that sounds like a lot of money. But it means that they <laughs> stay in the billionaires club. Um, yeah. So again, um, you know, because of the inequalities in sophistication that are inherent in in the market system, uh, you know, the the assetless few can can game legal processes in this way, and so mm-hmm. you know. I don't know. I won't. I won't. I've been. That was a. That was a circuitous and long answer. No, no, it's great. No, and that's exactly what I wanted to hear about. I mean, look, I've been interviewing people on the left mm-hmm. since two thousand nine, mm-hmm. and so far in this conversation, you don't sound different from it, many other critics of neoliberalism who are on the left. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, you can come up with a, a hundred different examples of the way in which, the ways in which neoliberalism is setting up inequality not only between workers and owners within countries but between countries mm-hmm. um and uh you know you you've got these multinational corporations that can that are often bigger than some of the uh, small developing nations that they exploit mm-hmm. um in terms of uh, assets that they hold um and uh it so the you know the other thing that strikes me is like these are the kinds of talking points that were, you know, and which are all true talking points that um, informed the Bernie Sanders campaign, right? The people who wanted to create social, a social democratic alternative within the Democratic Party. Mm-hmm. But what's interesting to me is that my understanding is that you want to create this social democratic alternative within the Republican Party or or maybe independently of either party, but that you're you're you're, you're not a, a leftist in the in yeah. the usual sense but you're a, a conservative a, a well i was a, i was a college trot as a oh you were okay well that explains <laughs> everything <laughs> mentioning but no i mean i've um uh I, my defining um so sort of the linchpin of my worldview is 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 catholicism i i converted when i was uh 31 years old uh in mm. 2016 so it's been a few years um mm. and um so, and as, as, as part of that, I mean, having been a college trot, but then making a very, uh, it's actually a very commonplace journey from a certain kind of Trotskyism to American conservatism. It's a, it's a well-trod path, let's say. Having done that, then as a, as a Catholic, I, be, you know, I sort of began to question the worldview that I was pushing as a editorial writer for the Wall Street Journal, right? Mm. It was the neoliberal organ. Um, and I became much more sympathetic to um, right wing populism as it was emerging in the mid 2010s. Um, Trump phenomenon was one expression. Brexit, um, uh, the law and justice in Poland, et cetera, et cetera. These kind of parties who were trying to um, blend various kinds of entitlement uh policies or welfare policies to, um, to to socially conservative cultural views that is not, you know, from a Catholic point of view, that's a pretty, um, you know, natural um, way to think about things. And so I, I, I gave those movements a quite, quite a, a positive reception over time. It took me a while because I was struggling against it. Um, but over time, I came to become quite sympathetic to these movements. Now, you know, looking back, it's been eight years since this kind of populist ferment took hold in the developing world. Sorry, in the developed world, mm-hmm. um, I think it didn't. It didn't work that way, which is why I don't want to build this within the Republican Party. I mean, if I if I, I don't think it works that you try to sort of realign one half of the political spectrum and then sort of use that to bash the other. Um, mm-hmm. I think um, if we want, if we want. I don't know if you want this because I know you're 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 intellectually you're you're a Marxist in a way that 
I no longer am. But yeah. if we want, for example, industrial policy, or if we want stronger labor unions, if we want, in short, if we want greater political control of the market, for, for politics to compass the market to a greater degree than neoliberalism permits, then it has to be a project of the center. Um, in the mm -hmm. same, in the way that the kind of post-war, mid-century class compromise model was not just, of course, it was FDR and a kind of progressive cohort, uh, militant labor unions, but it came to be accepted by Eisenhower and Nixon as well. So, you know, th through Nixon, the Republican Party had made its peace with class compromise. In some ways, Republican administrations extended and expanded the logics of the New Deal. Um, and likewise, neoliberalism was a bipartisan project. It wasn't just that, you know, Thatcher and Reagan, uh, you know, kind of promoted what you had, had been a set of fringe ideas percolating in the sort of Mont Pelerin society and Hayek and Friedman and so forth, mm -hmm. but that they could justifiably kind of take pride in the Clinton administration and Tony Blair's government, um, mm -hmm. so that they came to occupy the center. So I think if, if the goal, and I, again, we, this we can debate, I for, for just prudential reasons, I think that the best we can achieve is a kind of class compromise model. Um, if that's the aim, uh, then it, it, it cannot be just a thing of the right, and frankly, maybe not just a thing of the left, but a, a broad, you know, cross-partisan consensus which takes into account the fact that for most most people think neoliberalism is crazy. If you, for example, if you ex explain to them that um, that a lot of public, what used to be considered public services in the United States are now privately owned, not just privately owned, but owned by Wall Street. So that Wall Street is, as I document in the book, Wall Street is increasingly, owns the local ambulance provider and your local firefighting service is owned by private equity and hedge funds. Um, mm. And Private equity and hedge funds corrode the companies typically that they take over. They take, they lever them up with 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 a lot of debt. Um, they, um, you know, squeeze uh, costs wherever they can. The quality of services goes down. A few of them succeed, but many other businesses that are in this kind of ownership uh, fail. And that's okay for the from the point of view of the typical you know hedge fund boss or private equity owner because. Uh, you know, you make a bunch of bets and one of them succeeds and it's all a wash. But like the ordinary American can't take 15 jobs hoping that one of them will succeed. You only have the job that you have or the local community has only the kind of company that has been in town for many years. And that's it's their pride and joy. It can't they, they can't bet the same way. So we, if you learn that not only are, um, you know, ambulances and, and firefighting services now controlled by private equity, but also that. Um, the pensions of the public employees in these sectors are being used to finance the acquisition of their own jobs, the privatization of their own jobs by, by Wall Street. You tell that to people, every, every ordinary person says that's that's freaking insane. No one no one thinks that's that. And yet this neoliberal model. That's has, all being done in a legal way. Totally. You know, in a pretty normal financial, yeah. you know, yeah. what, what happens in a financialized neoliberal economy. Totally. You know, you. Totally. what are you going to do with those funds? You're going to just let them sit there? They have to get invested somewhere. And who's better to invest the pension funds so that these pensions will be, you know, will grow and they'll, you know, and do something for the economy than these hedge funds. By, by the people, way, right? by the way, private equity does, you know, over it, it, it's a myth that it does. It, it outperforms the ordinary Why? stock market <laughs> sort of hype. It's it, yeah. it does roughly the same. <laughs> As the, but that's the that's the reason that's the thinking behind correct, it. That's the mentality. Right. But if, so yeah. if you what I'm saying is if you explain that to ordinary people, um, whether they're you know dem, you know identify as Democrats, Republicans, or Independents, they think that's that would, that's crazy. Of course, I don't want my private firefighting company. Sorry, I, of course, I don't want my firefighting company to be run out of Lexington Avenue by some you know 35 year old Harvard MBA who's like just trying to squeeze. Um, squeeze as much as he can into his own asset ledger. Mm. Um, but it became a consensus and it became a left right consensus. And so um, and the as as this sort of populist ferment of the past eight years, however long you want to say it, it sort of petered out. And you look at what we're 
left with, I've come to the conclusion that it's, you know, right populism or new right populism um, alone doesn't work. In fact, in some ways, it's, um, you know, this is a kind of bitter reckoning for me. And I think probably there are many progressives who will hear this and they'll say, well, I could have told you so. But for me, I thought, look, there, this is... Um, there's something Jacksonian about this, these Jacksonian energies and the Trump movement and so forth. But I think for the most part, it's cashing out as um, culture war noise and sort of anti-elite noise that's all culturalist and not mm -hmm. really aimed at uh, reform at the level of political economy. Inside. That Tristan the School of Materialist Research is a self-sustainable platform where ideas are discussed in ways that would not be possible in conventional academia. The school is defined by its interest in the materialist approach to knowledge. Among its faculty are Julia Kristeva, Amanda Beach, Ben Woodward, Thomas Nail, and Paul Cockshot. The deadline for applications is September 4th, 2023. Check out the link to the School of Materialist Research in the description for this video. Yeah, and everything in it, it seems adequate and uh, and accurate to me um, in, in terms of describing reality. You know, it, 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 you uh, the prescription I'm not I'm not a hundred percent sure about, uh, um, especially on this side of the Bernie Sanders campaign. For so, from mm -hmm. my perspective, like you invested in um, in the Trump phenomenon as a kind of social democratic uh, stronghold against the neoliberal state in a, in a way, and and mm -hmm. and many people on the left did did the. the same thing with Bernie. We didn't get to see the left version of it get tested out through a presidency, mm -hmm. but um, or even through a nomination. But uh, well, yeah, there's a similar, like the the precarity uh, was what both the left and the right were trying to address in these different ways mm -hmm. um, through uh, trying to grab onto candidates who represented something other than the neoliberal center, which would be defined by. Uh, the Clintons or Obama or by Paul, know, Ryan. Uh, Paul Ryan or Mitt Romney or, you know, sure. or right. And so, yeah, they, what's really interesting about the, this moment, because I think we're in a post neoliberal moment and have mm. been since probably around 2008, 2009, really, mm. that the economic crisis that hit in 2009 made even Alan Greenspan say that his philosophy was wrong and something was was way off base um, but we haven't what hasn't happened is we don't have a milton friedman we don't have uh an a defined ideological response from the center to mm -hmm. for uh, informing us how we can change mm -hmm. to meet this crisis which has been going on for quite a while now um and which now is i think moved from the economic realm to the political realm to like international politics. Um, mm -hmm. But um, do you do you feel that your project is to create that kind of um, management approach to the crisis that as a trot you would have thought of as coming out of capitalism itself um, so that we can move beyond the neoliberal uh, moment into um, a more harmonious, less crisis filled future? I think I'm much more uh, a believer in than, than you would think. I'm much more a believer in uh, power from below uh, as a as a necessity in the in as a as a as an indispensable ingredient um, in doing this. Um, mm -hmm. In the sense that it, it, if we want politics to compass the market. That's my formula, right? That the, the, I think the way I, I describe it as a sort of political exchange, that is, um, you know, the market exchange has become deeply entrenched itself in our lives that in, in, in like obscene ways, we can't um, escape it, but that the market exchange should be subject to this, um, this uh, higher priority of exchange, which is political exchange between the classes to recognize that there are roughly speaking two classes. Now there's a third class of managers. If you're a Burnhamite, 
not just the Burnhamite, Burnhamite, but lots of New Deal thinkers were aware of this managerial class that is, that's emerging. I think that these managerial theories are a little overstated. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, and at any rate, the managers roughly behave the same way as the capitalists. So to think of the manager as like the enemy seems bizarre to me. You know what I mean? As, because that in some there, there there's there's a tendency to then be like, well, I'm not like Elon is showing it to the you know uh, <laughs> showing it to the managerial class. Therefore, Elon is a sort of proletarian hero. There is mm-hmm. this weird politics that mm-hmm. um, I, I don't buy. Mm-hmm. Um, but so that so if if that's the goal, the last time the the best we did um, was a combination of of elite consensus, but that elite consensus didn't just happen because of crises alone and a kind of you know, right. business elites recognizing that, look, uh, the topsy-turvy 19th century style capitalism isn't even good for business, but also it came from, there was an enormous pressure from from below. Yeah, social unrest, there was a real sure, organized, yeah. There yeah. was stabilizing things. Um, and so that's the role of the below. Um, and we see now this sort of beginnings of a of a of an ongoing labor ferment across industries across across geography of the American um, labor market, and mm-hmm. um, you know, but that so there you reach a sort of a practical question, right? So there are reasons to be doubtful about what whether my kind of class compromise renewal will work. And it has to do with the fact that the last time that kind of ferment had an enormous amount of effect on our politics, um, as Vivek Chibber, I think he's written a wonderful book called uh, The Class Matrix, points out, one, um, workers were actually politically disenfranchised in very sort of explicit, obvious, and enraging ways. And he Mm -hmm. argues that that paradoxically made them angry um, in a way that was potent. By contrast, there is political enfranchisement under liberalism, under neoliberalism, but you have the sense that no matter who, which politician you pull for, you get the same outcomes. So that the um, the response is a kind of dejected withdrawal or a depression, a a pulling away from the whole thing, cynicism. It's not quite the same as the rage. That you would experience, let's say, you can, no, you can find the rage, but it gets expressed through these cultural battles, sure, right? And, right. You right. know, or around right. particular issues. So, you know, you had the all of every major city in America was on fire uh, a couple of years exactly. ago, sure, you know, um, but be, in response to a real injustice, the murder of George Floyd. Um, but, but also, just so very quickly, I mean, industrial conditions is another factor that we don't quite have, you don't have this sort mm-hmm. of mass scale manufacturing. Um, which where, you know, workers are next to each other um, mm-hmm. experiencing their own dispossession in mm-hmm. close proximity. Um, and so that, that that's that, that those can uh, it's just by definition easier to organize in such a context compared mm-hmm. with the precarious world of the gig economy in which people are super atomized and so forth. And then the third factor is just the urban geography. I mean, again, you had those kinds of changes took places in densely packed ethnic neighborhoods. You know, you think of like the garment district in New York or what have you, similar neighborhoods in Chicago. That's not what the urban geography looks like. You have, um, you know, suburbanization, et cetera, et cetera. So you put that all that together, you say, well, there are some um, serious obstacles to trying to renew that model. And I address them, you know, one by one in the book. Mm. Argue that well, some of these changes they're not like the result of world historical inevitability, but just political choices. And if they're political choices, political choices can be reversed politically. Um, but those are the seri- those are the interesting objections to me is like uh, the practical ones. Well, I, I want to bring up something. Maybe we can uh, talk about this in the. Um... Second half, because what I'm hoping is we've we've been talking about for about 42 minutes. I'm hoping I can keep you for a second 40 minutes or so. Do you have sure, time for that? Sure. Yeah. And this will be the second half will be for the patrons. So uh, I'm gonna, you know, my my patrons and pretty much my followers are are getting sick of me talking about the 
war on disinformation, but I just can't help but talk about it. It's, uh, I've got some sort of psychological condition. Um, but I do want to ask you about uh, that in terms of your critique sure. of the man, the kind of the Burnhamite uh, uh, focus on managers. Mm -hmm. um, but but maybe we'll do that, and also about the drag shows and your and your um, Catholicism uh, yeah. in the second half. But uh, what I want to ask you that I didn't get a chance to is when you close out your book, co making a call for uh, a return to politics. I mean, you just sort of made that same gesture now. Um, what? How do you conceive of uh, this return of pol to politics after Trump? I mean, he may be coming back, but in a, in a way, let's just pretend mm -hmm. that, that we're after Trump and we're uh, in a moment where the and, and with the Sanders campaign not having had success and um, kind of a, uh, a what is, I think, generally felt to be the uh, failure of populism or left populism, which is when when it becomes left populism, it often describes itself as social democracy. Um, uh, uh, how do you think of the return to politics coming now? Well, oh man, that is a, that's a depressing um, question because I, I see enormous, um, I see enormous reconsolidation in, in favor of the forces of depoliticization. On the right, I see the DeSantis campaign as um, for all the sort of uh, noise it makes around cultural issues. And in some cases, I'll be honest, I, I'm like, I'm more on the side of like DeSantis on some of these cultural issues than, than DeSantis's critics and enemies. But I, I, what I see fundamentally is on the right, this is where I, that's the world that I know better, that like basically the big Wall Street donors and others have found a way to make certain noises um, about cultural issues, about elites, um, even as they try to return to the right's older agenda, which was, um, you know, these ghoulish entitlement cuts, uh, you know, a, an expansionist foreign policy, et cetera, et cetera. That's what I frankly see uh, Ron DeSantis um, embodying um that's fair yeah, we're kind of, uh, holding on to reaganism or neoliberalism correct correct but with but with a sort of populist uh uh mirage or, or facade by the way that's a very it's a very old phenomenon in american politics of of um of figures you know you could you could find like um in the Jacksonian era, who learned the Jacksonian vernacular, but represented like the interests of, of banks or like local capitalist elites, mm -hmm. not, not George Bush, class. George Bush on his ranch in his cowboy hat, you know, sure. or yeah. Yeah, you yeah. know, or it's an old phenomenon. Um, so that's on the right. Um, on the left, it seems to me that um, the the Biden administration has taken on. And this is Trump's one success, maybe in some ways, has taken on some elements of the critique and run with it and actually like operationalized it in policy. So seriously pursuing industrial policy in a way that, of course, the right never would in this country. Now, you might say, well, is it too green, you know, at the expense of other kinds of other sectors, et cetera? I'm talking about the Inflation Reduction Act and the sort of broader suite of industrial policies the Biden administration is championing, you can object to here and there, but that at least they're they're doing it. Um, mm -hmm. the, the tariffs on China aren't aren't going away. And, um, you know, in, 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 in several ways, the Biden administration is signaling that um, it's a post neoliberal administration. Um, mm -hmm. The most notable Even their immigration policy hasn't really correct correct right correct mm -hmm. and i think that's one of those, like one of their weaknesses um but like jake sullivan's speech i don't know if you paid attention to that that was very interesting where he basically denounced the washington consensus as a failure hadn't worked for workers etc cetera, etc cetera. Mm -hmm. but they're doing it in their you know biden administration style which is not i don't know there's there's something uh, 
like you said, managerial about it, you know, mm -hmm. even as they sort of take on these policies, they frame, you know, the populous half of the country as, you know, enemies of the state, as bad people, et cetera. Um, so put all that together. And all I'm trying to say is that repoliticization in the aftermath of of Trump is, is an uphill battle. I, I fully recognize that. Right. It's like um, it seems to me like the the forces of depoliticization, depoliticization, even if they con take on the substance of certain populist policies, um, in terms of form, they're they're re-entrenching, they're digging in, they're in for the, you know, the long haul. Well, listen, let, let's uh, close out the first half here. I'm going to go refill my coffee cup. If you enjoyed this conversation, please do consider supporting us on Patreon. Our patrons help to make sure that Sublation Media can continue to provide interviews, videos, books, and articles that are critical of the left from the left. If you are tired of remaining stuck within bourgeois ideologies and politics, help us sublate them both. <laughs>